except that means I can open the floor for questions. Well, not too many, obviously, but uh, a couple. So, does anybody wish to put a question to either uh, His Excellency or to the Professor Publishing? Okay, so we'll start with Andrew. And then there was one there. Uh, my question relates uh, more to the first lecture, but anyone can comment on it anyway. Um, to what extent, I'm not sure if you agree or not, does there probably exist some type or process of uh, European chauvinism towards uh, countries such as the Ukraine? And I use the term the Ukraine because many Western European countries would still refer to Ukraine as the Ukraine, which perhaps gives one a sense of uh, that country as some type of uh, a region rather than a nation state of itself. Um, and also as well related to that, even uh, environmentalists, you know, uh, advocating um, preservation of something like the European bison would prefer to keep the European bison within the boundaries of the European Union, in Poland for example, and, and a lot of them are concerned that the, if the bison travels over into the Ukraine, then for some reason, you know, these Ukrainians might, you know, eat them alive or something. So there's, this, there's still a, a, an almost fear, you know, like uh, places such as Belarus and Ukraine often depicted as, you know, by various dictatorships as opposed to the enlightened. Okay, Andrew, can you wrap it up? So make sure so that others get a go. I just wanted to see if, if, if you know, if, if anyone can comment or agree that that's, this is what's stopping more fraternal relations between the European Union and countries such as Ukraine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Marco, would you like to take this question first? And maybe you know, members can uh, add to it. Yeah, look, I think it's, it's impossible to avoid uh, value-laden perceptions. Um, and in, in this instance, um, no matter what happens at the level of official dialogue, level of polite international exchange. There are such things as uh, popular perceptions, widespread perceptions, which, which think of Europe in terms of a kind of a gradient with, with highly civilized places in the West. And then as you move further east, the <coughs> level of, of, of civilization somehow uh, diminishes. And you know, people can, can point to certain uh, economic facts and they can point to certain uh, political facts which would um, uh, confirm or tend to confirm such perceptions. Uh, but this, this is a, a fact, I suppose, of uh, human life. That, that, uh, it's very difficult uh, for uh, stereotypes to be overcome and for genuine uh, equality to be not only proclaimed but uh, practiced between the powerful and the less powerful, the rich and the less rich. Um, and look, I, I think your observation basically is, is correct. There, there continues to be a perception along the line. Yes, I can only add that we did experience this. I mean, we were treated like the youth of our ancient painters, troublemakers, Polish people had a good opinion on their about among those who read literature, but others were not ignorant of what we did or what we didn't. But what is, what is the, uh, I mean, the answer to it? First of all, you, you cannot ignore it, but you, you, you should, this shouldn't be the, 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 uh, the source of your, uh, of your sort of overreacting and, 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 you know, and despising. Because it's a fact of life. As, as, and you, you have it everywhere, even in families. Uh, so what you do, either you want to be part of the EU and you show them that you can do it, or you simply ignore it. We have chosen the best part, and uh, we have implemented the plans. We are now, uh, you know, doing very well. And the image then changes. I mean, uh, the 
French invasion of Poland, which I call it the most successful invasion of Poland ever. There are almost one million people, well, not 600,000 in Great Britain, it's the 100,000 Irish Polish people. And, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the election was, was contrary to the, to the uh, previous, uh, uh, as you call it, chauvinistic or negative image of, of Poland. So uh, I think that the, uh, as I said, uh, you, you, one cannot ignore it, that one can build up its policy over such a bad or negative image. If you build a policy just because you are not lying, uh, then, uh, then you are rather not very much into, into success. We have time for one more. Just, just one more, and a very brief one. So. But uh, what's the name? Okay, look me up, maybe just yeah, one very short. Very quick. Very quick. Recent development about security, because the major threat, it's not sort of military threat, but what the Russia supplies fuel to Europe, as Markos told us. And we have um, basically what happens that um, it's, Your Excellency, you may enlighten me on this too, because uh, Poland buys the Russian gas for 500, uh, five, 500 they pay $500 for, for, for one cubic meters. At the same time, Germany pays just over $100 per cubic meters. Well, one month before, there was an announcement in the Gazeta Wyborcza in Poland that they are going to sue Russia for these arbitrary prices. How how you estimate the chances of winning in this uh, arbitration? Uh, it's one, and the second that is NAFTA gas Ukrainian trans uh, tra pi uh, transit pipeline. Does uh, in Russian in Russian newspapers to which I am exposed, they claim that now Russian uh, uh, Gazprom will own the tra transit pipeline, and they already take over the Belarus trans. So is it really uh, true or it's not true? Well, I think that these are very good questions because they show the, the, the real problems now you have, I mean, as far as security is concerned. It has nothing to do with the war, with the rights and so on. But this but certain energy is used by Russia, and to be quite frank, not only by Russia, as a political tool. Uh, at, as far as these uh, different prices that the Germans are paying and the Poles are paying, I mean, I do not know the contracts of both. I do not think the Germans will pay more, but I'm not sure that Poles will pay less. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but, but you know, but this is another situation. Imagine Poland would not be a member of the EU. Our position would be much weaker. Who would then try to uh, protect also our interests? Who would then try to speak on our behalf? But then there would be a one or two declarations, and then that's all. So in this sense, of course, this is to some extent, one would say, uh, uh, a sort of a, 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 a substitute of, of real war. You know, it's not no longer this, it's not on energy, it's food. From time to time, Russia says, we do not want to buy your beef. Not only to call it to many European countries. Uh, or chicken for is, it, yes. is, it, is it a war? Well, Russians claim that we are doing the same. That each country puts some barriers, some restrictions, uh, and uh, and so so it is. With energy, the problem is much more, of course, uh, serious than with food. But then we have also access to water, access to their materials. So uh, I I think fortune, fortune, thanks be to God, fortunately we are living with in a world where economic issues, soft security issues, food issues are, are the area of conflicts and tensions and different interests. Uh, and fortunately, we have not only legal framework, but also organizations such as the European Union to resolve them. Uh, so, you know, uh, I thought that somebody would ask me about financial crisis. Ah. Yes, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and uh, and uh, there was a, there was a, a 
presentation uh, that brought up by national radio, some of us, and uh, I permitted myself to to say a lie that uh, uh, that uh, for special polls, uh, I would prefer to have a financial crisis than any crisis we have experienced before. It's a matter of different perspective. This is, a, of course, a crisis. And we are we are going to resolve it. How and with what success, it is not, it's not certain. Nobody says in Europe, in Europe that we know what the future will be. Uh, the communist leaders said it, and the Nazi leaders said it. They knew, but we don't. But one thing is sure, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that this crisis, in comparison to other historical crises, Europe, had uh, gone through in the 19th century, in the 20th century, is, is almost a luxury crisis. And I would like to, call, to end this with the word crisis, so I would say thank you. Well, let's end with the word luxury. Luxury. <laughs> <laughs> That's much more European. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've got to stop here. I'm sure you will continue asking questions in the tutorials and so on. Uh, yes, well, uh, uh, to our next um, uh, event, which is not so much to do with luxury, but sometimes an area of human activity that can be connected to luxury, and that is trade. Uh, and this is uh, the next 50 years, Austria and Europe as business partners in the Asian century. And we have Nicola Watson, who is Consul General and Senior Trade and Investment Commissioner in Western Europe. Um, from the Australian Trade Commission Austria, who will be talking and uh, followed by Igor Ben, Director of EWU Management, I won't bore you with the details. And that's taking place next Monday from 2 o'clock to 3 p.m. and we'll have to go to Clayton for it. <laughs> so I have some of you with us and we will be there. Uh, and if you're not mailing this anywhere, you will not receive information. But please, let's thank our two speakers. And I look forward to seeing you at our next event. Mm -hmm.